Welcome to the program. We call this program the historical facts from the Reformation to modern times. And it is really important that we understand history because if we do not understand history we are doomed to repeat history as the saying goes. So, and in particular to understand the history that is so well documented from the time of the Reformation right up to modern times. This is most important that we do this. And I'm very privileged to have with me today Pastor Bill and Carol, who is well known in biblical studies and historical studies. And it is a joy to have him here again to speak now about the Reformation times right to modern times. So welcome, Bill. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. So it is hard to overestimate the importance of knowing history. Um, there is a fairly widespread ignorance of history, even things that are well known. There is a well known history, for example, of the Second World War, but the papal involvement with the dictators during the Second World War is not well known. So it is important that we, we document and give the historical facts and that we do this right from the time of the Reformation up to modern times. And I um, know that it will be a joy to share these things with you and an encouragement and a warning that if we do not understand the facts of history, we are destined to be overtaken and overtaken in particular by the Church of Rome who tries to rewrite history. Now I want to begin by having Bill here explain for us what was the response of the Catholic Church to the remarkable success that the reformers had at the time of the Reformation. How did the Catholic Church respond and just what happened after the Reformation? Well, Richard, as, as you well know, the response of, the, of Roman Catholicism to the biblical faith of the Reformers was uh, uh, vicious, uh, and it was called, in, in, hi in the history of books, it's called the Counter-Reformation, uh, against, counter, against the Reformation. It was advanced principally through the political and educational influence of the Jesuit order of Romanism. This religious society was founded by Ignatius of Loyola in the year 1530 AD and recognized officially by the Pope at that time, Pope Paul III, 10 years later, a decade later. The Jesuits, uh, in a very uncompromising, uh, very militant manner, led a movement to restore Roman Catholicism to the position it had had before the Reformation. They became known as the Pope's shock troops, the Pope's army, uh, to restore Catholicism to what it once was. Ign Ignatius, the founder of, of this order, his most important endeavor, uh, his, his, his purpose was to again lock down the, the, both the rulers of countries and the common people uh, of, the, of the Holy Roman Empire, various uh, uh, countries that made up the Holy Roman Empire, into unquestioning obedience to the Roman Catholic Church. That was the purpose, to put them into unquestioning obedience, which means unquestioning obedience, of course, to the Pope. His primary tactic was to train his men, the Jesuits, to excellence in various skills and professions and their intent was primarily to convert the children of Bible believers back to Catholicism. They wanted to convert adults, of course, as well. But their primary focus was the children, just as the great, famous, but great in the bad sense, but the famous dictators of history, uh, Lenin, uh, Stalin, uh, Hitler, go on and on, 
uh, are on record as saying, give me the children and I will own the society. Uh, and so that's what the Jesuits wanted to do, get the children, particularly the, uh, the, the, the rulers' children, the various ruler, uh, rulers, uh, the important people in society. Uh, they became the tutors and teachers to these children because of their excellence in their studies and uh, uh, in their various fields. Their intent, again, lead the nations back to the old captivity to papal Rome. Now, in some countries, uh, principally Spain, uh, and Italy, uh, the Reformation had not uh, taken hold uh, significantly. Uh, and the Jesuits were able to swoop in and solidify the hold that Roman Catholicism had on the heads of states uh, of, those, of those nations and nation states and the people. Uh, in other countries, however, uh, for example, Poland, uh, ooh, and I'm proud to have some Polish heritage, uh, the Reformation had established, had taken hold tremendously and established, in fact, schools and colleges, Protestant schools, Protestant colleges. The Jesuits still relentlessly sought to undermine what had been achieved uh, in the expansion of biblical faith, of the true gospel. Uh, that was their successful tactic then, and this isn't just history, it's still today. Many people were and still are won over to Catholicism through parents sending their children to private Catholic schools and universities where they're given a Catholic education. Uh, we have the case today, many fine Bible-believing Protestant parents will send their children to a Catholic school. Uh, and then they're surprised when the children either convert to Catholicism or certainly pick up uh, many ideas that are foreign to Scripture. Uh, that's where they learned it. Uh, See, the Jesuits' intention, then and now, is to indoctrinate populations. They accomplish this not so much by overtly teaching Catholic, Catholic, excuse me, Catholic doctrine, but they interpret through their school systems every subject matter from an underlying doctrinal viewpoint that is standard Roman Catholicism. As always, it's always rather the Catholic viewpoint that's predominantly taught and promoted uh, in these schools, even in our day of so-called dialogue with Catholics that some Protestants have fallen into that trap. Furthermore, if the students are not converted to Catholicism, uh, they are rendered less effective in their biblical witnessing, in their biblical faith, because of their Catholic training. That's why it's so insidious. That's why. That's why Bible believers have absolutely no business sending their children to Catholic institutions. Absolutely no business doing that. Now another means which Ignatius taught to draw people into the, back into the Catholic Church, or for the first time, was a well thought out program of self-mastery and self-discipline. His principal book was called Spiritual Exercises, and that was intended to teach people how to deny themselves completely and how to reach a mystical union with God. Uh, and that's a works righteousness approach, of course. Uh, the self-denial uh, uh, and, and reaching this so-called mystical union uh, with God is, is a, it's a works righteousness. Uh, uh, the, the child of that is existentialism and de-orthodoxy. Uh, his conviction, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, Loyola, uh, Ignatius, his conviction was that self-denial and these mystical experiences would lead to full, full obedience to the Roman Church because they'd done that for Ignatius of Loyola himself. The populations that are not grounded in the Bible are notoriously superstitious. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I once heard it said that uh, uh, if, if you don't believe in uh, the God of the Bible, uh, it's not that you won't believe in, in uh, anything, it's that you will believe in anything, uh, is superstitions. And because populations that aren't grounded in the Bible, they don't have any sure knowledge of God through Jesus Christ and His written word, the Bible, mysticism has a great appeal to these people. And so Ignatius was able to play off of that as well, and the Catholic Church does that all the time, uh, particularly as these people face their future. To such people that are adrift in spiritual darkness, uh, the Catholic Church offers the spiritual authority of the Pope 
and his visible rituals to give them a sense of, of, st of stability. Uh, then the, the, uh, Catholicism offers people the thrill of mystical experiences in place of spiritual truth. Uh, truly, Catholicism is an utterly deceptive organization. Now, by the mid-17th century, the Society of Jesus, uh, as the Jesuit order was called, had thousands of members across Europe, all across Europe. Uh, their mission then and now has been the eradication of the efforts of the Reformation. Uh, over the next few centuries, the Jesuits became the papacy's most powerful force to affect Western culture. The Jesuits have had a strong political influence with uh, Catholic monarchies across Europe. It's an it's a indisputable matter of history. They've led the main Counter-Reformation efforts for four centuries by upholding papal authority, uh, restoring the sacramental system, uh, pr promoting this mysticism with its, all these superstitions to those nations, many nations, that had been touched by the biblical principles of the Reformation. Much of what papal Rome has achieved since the Reformation and in modern times has been due to the planning and strategy of the Jesuits. Yes, this is quite true that the Jesuits succeeded right across Europe and uh, they were quite successful even in places like Poland uh, where they really stamped out what had been biblical faith growing in Poland. But nonetheless, while papal Rome was advancing, a fact of history really brought an end to what had been one of their, their main ways of advancing over the years. And that was their fact that they were a civil power and that they had papal states and that they controlled people not simply as a religious organization, but through civil law, because they were recognized to be a civil state, and they had power over princes and kings. And so this actually came to an end, and it was one of Napoleon's generals who brought it to an end. Napoleon's generals came into Italy and into Rome, and into the Vatican itself, and they removed Pope Pius VI from his papal throne. Not only was he physically taking off his papal throne, but they removed his civil power, his right to territory as a civil power was taken from him by force of arms. And this really brought an end to the Holy Roman Empire. The empire had ruled for many centuries across Europe and Rome being the one to dictate the rules for the emperor. And it is amazing how it all fell by Napoleon's general. And uh, we had the demise of Romanism as a civil power that happened in 1798 and it was complete. It was the end of civil power as such and um, it was with the demise of this civil power that Rome had counted on for so many years that we had a, 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 an amazing attempt to re-establish the power and glory of Rome, even though it now lacked one of its main weapons of being civil power. And there was one pope who was remarkable in this, to this, uh, in this endeavor to restore the papacy to some of its power and glory, and it was Pope Pius IX. He's often known in the history books as Pio Nono, the Italian name, Pius IX. And he ruled in the Catholic Church for a long, long time, from 1846 to 1878. And it was a time of nationalism across Europe, and even in Italy itself. Italy had become an independent republic, much 
to the displeasure of the Pope who fought against the fact that Italy was going to be independent. It became an independent republic in 1849. And now the papacy had neither territory itself, it had not civil power, and where it had ruled from in Italy, it didn't even have a, it, it, a place that they could call its own to be a civil, to be recognized as a civil state. The papacy had really lost a lot, but not in the mind of Pius IX. He set about to restore power and glory to the Roman Church. And he had a, an intent behind what he did. First of all, his intent was to proclaim a dogma, a dogma called papal infallibility. The dogma that the Pope is infallible in all matters that he speaks on faith and morals, that he has a divine prerogative infallibility. Now this was something that had been unknown even in tradition of the Catholic Church. There were famous Catholic historians such as Dollinger and uh, Bernard Haster who showed that not only was this teaching not in scripture, but there was no traces of it in any of the history of the Catholic Church or in the traditions. It was never claimed. Nonetheless, while his own historians argued against it, and while there was no mention of it in Scripture, Pius IX set about to establish this as a dogma, and he got it proclaimed as a dogma in 1870 at what was the First Vatican Council. And so this was the first way that Pius IX sought to re-establish, and now he centralized things that churches could look to an infallible authority that the Pope himself was infallible. He could not make any mistake or error in matters of faith and morals. Then Pius IX was very clever because he saw that he needed to have the papacy to be in full command of all the bishops across Europe. And it had been a tradition in most European countries that it was the people, the ordinary people of the churches that got together with their clergy to elect who should be bishops in the different areas of the different parts of the church. Even the Church of Rome, it was the privilege of the local churches to say who was to be their bishop or their leader. Pius IX said, no, this has to end. And he claimed to have authority to appoint bishops, and of course later on to appoint archbishops and cardinals, so that power would be centralized in Rome. And he was successful, and this became also decrees of, of the Council, the Vatican Council, one that bishops were to be appointed by the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. He had authority. And so the claim for papal infallibility and the claim, the successful claim that was brought about under Pius IX, that the popes alone appoint bishops and later archbishops and cardinals. So this centralized power. And these two factors greatly enhanced the Church of Rome even when they had no civil power. And uh, it became even more emphatic under the successor to Pius IX. The successor was Pius X, and he set about to bring about all the different laws of the Catholic Church into one code called the Code of Canon Law. And this was established 
so that the Church of Rome had the Code of Canon Law from 1917 onwards. And this really centralized power that the Roman Church was organized absolutely under the dictates of the Pope and what he said, not only for the people of Rome, but for other churches. Their claim and their laws of how churches were to be organized, down to details of clerical dress and on and on, all in the Code of Canon Law. And this became known in, um, and publicized to the world in 1917. Then there came an historical fact that was to change Romanism, and I'd like that you would speak about this historical C fact. Certainly will, certainly will. Uh, historical fact uh, is the Lateran Treaty in 1929. Uh, this really uh, establishes how the, the uh, Roman Catholicism, the Catholic Church, became a modern nation. Now we think about the Roman Catholic Church, a lot of people say, what are you talking about, a nation? That's, it's a religion, it's a, it's a church. Well, it's far more than that. It is a nation, uh, as we'll see. It has ambassadors in, in uh, 174 countries around the world. It, it has uh, uh, established itself, uh, it governs itself as a nation. It's a sovereign uh, 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 nation itself. Uh, so it, it certainly is a nation. And uh, in 1929, uh, Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy, signed the Lateran Treaty with Pope Pius XI, in which Mussolini officially conceded Vatican Hill to the Pope. Uh, so the wound that had been inflicted, as Revelation talks about, on the beast was healed, for the papacy again became a sovereign civil state in its own right, as it once was. The legal agreement with Mussolini was the first of many civil concordats, uh, which are, are agreements, uh, contracts, and we'll talk about those in a minute, uh, uh, between the Vatican and, and countries. Uh, one of the most infamous of these concordats was the one between Pope Pius XII and Adolf Hitler. Uh, the papacy had again begun to consolidate its power from within uh, by the 1917 Code of Canon Law, and from without in the legal concordats with Mussolini in 1929 uh, and by the Oxford movement in England in the 19th century. Richard, I, would you speak to that? Yes, please? it's amazing how these things advance the Catholicism, the Lateran Treaty, uh, and then the, the uh, other concordats that we will talk about later on, but the fact that a whole movement took place called the Oxford movement. Now, it's amazing we gave an account of the Jesuits being successful across Europe, but they were not really successful whatsoever in Ireland and England. In actual fact, they had been banned legally. The civil authorities banned. The Jesuits were not allowed to even exist in these territories. But there was a change. The civil authorities, the in England, the civil authorities recognized the Jesuits and called the Catholic Emancipation Act of 1829. They were allowed to come back into England, and back they did come. And the Oxford movement was started soon after that in 1833. Its best known leader was John Henry Newman. Newman started off as an Anglican, and his intent and purpose, as he explains himself, was to make Anglicanism, what had been the Reformation Church and the truly biblical church in England, to be not distinguishable from the Roman Church, in actual fact to become more and more Roman Catholic. Now this looked not to be possible, but John Henry Newman set about doing it and it was called the Oxford Movement, sometimes the Tractarian Movement, and they set about by tracts to rewrite what had been the facts of scripture and history. They set about to change prophecy where the Church of Rome had been proclaimed to be the Antichrist and shown to be 
the one who fulfills Second Thessalonians 2, Revelation 17 and 18 and other parts of scripture. But they said no, that the, the prophecy does not show anything. It is as some future coming of the man of sin and at the end times. They rewrote what was in the scripture to make it look as if it's going to be some future antichrist to come and they set about to change the Anglican Church and to bring in what they called Anglo-Catholics that the Anglican Church would become Anglo-Catholic, it would become part and parcel like the Catholic Church because they would accept more and more the dogmas and teachings of the Church of Rome and through many tracks they they really set out to bring the population under the Church of Rome by misusing scripture and misusing facts of history to bring people under subjection. It is an amazing story and it has been documented and it is quite sad how they re-instigated Romanism within the Church that had been the Reformation Church, the Anglican Church, and it became more and more like onto the Church of Rome. This attempt to bring back the Anglican Church to become again under the Roman Church has been quite successful. And in recent times, with the visit of Benedict the Sixteenth to uh, the UK in 2010, and to uh, vener make John Henry Newman a venerable uh, on the road to become a saint and to meet again with the leaders of the Anglican Church and even to speak at the House of Parliament in the, uh, uh, as a civil uh, man he spoke in the House of Parliament to the two House of Parliament Lords and the ordinary House of Commons he spoke as a civil leader it was to bring England in the Anglican Church back under Rome. It has succeeded to a large part. It has not completed as yet, but what had started in the Oxford movement has reached some success in 2010 with the visit of the Pope to England. Besides this, we have to see something of how the Church of Rome continued what Newman had started to teach people about futurism and I'd ask you Bill to show us or teach us just what futurism is. Well, certainly, certainly Richard. Futurism is a, is a method of interpreting uh, predictive prophecy in the scriptures uh, particularly uh, Daniel and uh, focusing on, on most particularly the book of Revelation uh, that the book of Revelation and the predictive prophecies uh, are pretty much exclusively about the end times. Uh, and Roman Catholicism was very successful with this uh, oh, back in uh, 1599, you know, right around the, the, the time that the Re Reformation was getting started. Because historically, uh, Protestant biblical scholars, uh, virtually universally, have said that the Antichrist is the papacy, is the Vatican. Uh, not just an individual pope, but the papacy, the, the pope himself. Uh, that's been the historic view of the church. Uh, but Catholicism cleverly countered that by saying, oh, no, 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 the book of Revelation is about, all about the future. So therefore, it can't be the pope. The pope can't be the Antichrist because he's, uh, this, the Antichrist comes in the future, and we have the pope, so he can't be the Antichrist. Uh, it's very clever. Uh, and that's how the papacy has consolidated its power. In fact, futurism has paved a way for acceptance uh, of papal Rome by evangelicals. Uh, this fact uh, we observed by evangelicals in the 19th century. Uh, it was then the work of a 17th century Jesuit, uh, Manuel Lacunza. Uh, that, his work flowered on futurism and was propagated by the Brethren uh, Church. Uh, you've probably heard of the Brethren, of the Plymouth Brethren. The Brethren Group of Churches was formed in Dublin, Ireland uh, in the year 1827. One of its founders was John Nelson Darby, a name you may know. 
He attended Bible prophecy meetings just uh, south of Dublin, and the topics discussed included the Antichrist, uh, the man of sin in the Bible, uh, and the meaning of the 1260 days uh, in Revelation before the Antichrist appearance. Uh, now, Darby and his followers accepted the writings of Lacunza as if Lacunza's claim to be a born-again Jew were true, which they're not. Then the brethren surpassed the Oxford movement, as Richard has discussed, in publishing tracts that foretold future events. In this way, the roots of futurism, uh, planted uh, uh, two centuries earlier uh, by the uh, Jesu uh, Jesuit Counter-Reformation, grew in strength. Uh, John Henry Newman, uh, John Nelson Darby, in fact, they brought into prominence brought into prominence in the evangelical world and in the fundamentalist churches, the futuristic efforts of the Jesuits, in particularly the work of uh, Manuel Lacunza. Now these Jesuits said that most of the book of Revelation deals with three and a half literal years immediately preceding the return of Jesus Christ. So Car uh, John Carl Newman, uh, Darby, and their disciples followed that teaching. So the, uh, the historic, as I said, the historic interpretation of Scripture acknowledges that the office of the papacy is the Antichrist of Scripture. That was forgotten by the brethren. Uh, the Schofield Bible, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, many of you probably have used, uh, that accepts the futuristic interpretation uh, and has led many into this Roman Catholic uh, a lie, uh, but accepting futurism. Matter of fact, the Schofield Reference Bible was first published in 1909 and uh, underwent extensive revision and new edition of uh, 1917. Uh, it's had subsequent revisions, but it was an extremely significant factor in promoting futurism uh, in evangelical and fundamentalist churches. Uh, its notes on Revelation have been, for many fundamentalists, a major source for various futuristic theories. Uh, and there are various timetables. I'm sure you've seen the charts with the various timetables on them. This is a, a lot of that comes out of this futurism idea. Uh, with Schofield, the historic church age was regarded as a parenthesis in history. Uh, this futuristic presupposition has been popularized by religious writers. They've picked up on this. Very popular writers such as Hal Lindsey, uh, the late great planet Earth of it wasn't that long ago that every Christian had a copy of the late great planet Earth. It was one of the, I think I've read it, so it was one, and if not the best-selling uh, uh, book of its kind, uh, a Christian book, nonfiction type uh, book, although it is fiction, uh, in, uh, in publishing history. A tremendous number, translated in all sorts of different languages around the world. Uh, another more recent work, uh, in thoroughly in the Roman Catholic futurism theory, uh, is uh, Tim LaHaye. Uh, in his last days, and uh, left behind rather, the left behind series of novels and, and films like that. It's just insidious in, in, the, in the church today and it's a Roman Catholic invention. Uh, so the futurism of Schofield, which are unlocked from the facts of history, uh, they ignore the historic, uh, the historic church view uh, of predictive prophecy. Uh, the, the futurism of Schofield, the Oxford movement that brought the English Bible believers back to papal Rome have seriously supplanted the historic interpretation of Scripture throughout the centuries. So futuristic teaching that originating from the Jesuits as it did effectively hid and effectively hides the presence of Antichrist from modern, uh, evangel uh, the modern evangelistic world. We now come to study the 20th century, the wars of the 20th century, and um, people have a great knowledge of the First and Second World Wars, and people have a great idea of what went on, but very few people are aware of the Vatican part of the cruelty and the wars that went on, and the, the Vatican's working together with dictators. The Vatican no longer had civil authority to dictate to rulers of the world. It no longer had uh, authority to impose its wills civilly. 
but it had great authority with dictators, all of whom were Roman Catholics. And I'd like to list some of these famous dictators who ruled in different nations. And the Catholic, work, the Catholic Church worked together with each one of these dictators. With Mussolini in Italy from 1922 to 1943, with Adolf Hitler in Germany from 1933 to 1945, with Francisco uh, Franco in Spain from 1936 to 1975, with Antonio Salazar in Portugal from 1932 to 1968, with Engelbert, Dusloff, and Kurt von Schuschnigg in Austria from 1932 to 1934, with Juan Perón in Argentina from 1946 to 1955, and possibly the most bloodthirsty and horrific of them all was Anton Pavlik in Croatia from 1941 to 1945. To come to the most famous of these dictators that the Catholic Church worked with, and that is Hitler. Hitler was baptized into the Catholic Church. He was a communicant and he even was an altar boy. When he grew up, he had been born in Austria. To the day of his suicide, he remained Roman Catholic. And just how far the Roman Church will go with dictators who were quite evil in their intent is seen in their involvement with Hitler and with the Nazis. Uh, the Nazi movement had been particularly strong in Bavaria and southern Germany where we had most Catholics and not in northern Protestant Germany. It was in southern Germany that en masse the Catholics joined the Nazi party so the, the the um, Catholics were part of the whole regime that was being set up by Hitler. And at the height of his power in Germany in 1942, he ruled the most powerful Catholic population in the whole world. Now the German Catholics were accustomed to authoritarian rule in their church with what the Pope said, claiming to be infallible, was what they obeyed. Now, it was no big thing for them to accept Hitler's authoritarian rule. And so they continued in civil matters to do what they were doing already in spiritual matters. So Catholics became subservient to Hitler just as they did to their own church. And uh, it was uh, amazing what this brought about. Just a little aside, we have to see a little bit about uh, what had been probably the worst persecution and that was under Anton Pavlik in Croatia. Uh, he worked together with the archbishop or prelate, uh, the Catholic prelate called Alois Stepinik and in a convert or die policy in Croatia. There were 900,000 Greek Orthodox Serbs at that time in Croatia. And the Catholic policy was to wipe them out or bring them into the Catholic Church. They succeeded with 200,000 being compelled to convert and come into the Church of Rome. However, 700,000 chose not to convert but to remain true to their beliefs and choose to die. Most of these were tortured, burnt or buried alive after they had the ignominy of digging their own graves. The appalling persecution under the Ustashi was the head of the, the name of the, the um, troops and people who caught, brought out this atrocious persecution. The appalling uh, persecution was brought about by the Catholic Church itself and its leaders. It was many of their priests and their monks who led 
this savage persecution with hatchet, with dagger, and they went after the Serbians and they persecuted the Serbians from church to church. They imprisoned them, they tortured them. They had them dig their own graves. And the Catholic Church was not using the civil power, but directly Catholic priests working together with others, Catholics and the Sashi, wiping out what had been the Serbian uh, believers in Croatia. So that this was to become a Roman Catholic state, that the religion of Croatia was to be the religion of the Roman Church. It is sad to see how they succeeded in Croatia and to this day how Croatia has become so Roman Catholic, the nation that had been Serbian Orthodox. So this is one of the horrendous things of the Second World War was the horrific persecution that took place in Croatia all under the authority of the Catholic Church. Now the Catholic Crusades where they sent out their armies to uh, take back the uh, Holy Land and other places and their Inquisition where they persecuted believers for 605 years has stopped and they're working together with dictators as they did in the 20th century and I listed some of them uh, uh, this has all stopped, but the Catholic influence continues politically and on a civil note, and this is important. They have continued and they're highly successful now, but they've had a change of face, and we must deal with this change of face, and I ask that you, Bill, would explain this change of face that has taken place in the Church of Rome. Well, certainly, Richard, and that's a very good phrase to use, a change of face, a change of appearance, but not of substance. Uh, it's taken place in the Vatican's rewriting of history, and it's influenced nation by nation by civil power in these nations. First, Papal Rome set about rewriting history in its changing of the name of the Inquisition. Uh, you know, quite often uh, we see uh, changes of name uh, to make things appear more palatable, but nothing really changes. Well, the shrewd name change for one of the main departments of the Vatican's organization in times past was called the Office of the Inquisition. Now it is called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. That sound nice? Sounds so innocent. This change is explained by Roman Catholic author, I will point out, he's Roman Catholic and theologian Peter De Rosa in his book Vicars of Christ the dark side of the papacy. In that he writes, quote, In recent years, having a bad press, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Inquisition, like the Soviet secret police, he writes, had been renamed more than once. In 1908, this oldest of Rome's sacred congregations became the Holy Office. From 1967, it changed to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, unquote. Now this Roman Catholic author compares the changing of the name of the Inquisition to the changing of the name of the Soviet secret police, which has had several different name changes, but it's all the same. Then the papacy attempted to write, whitewash the history of the Inquisition by asking for pardons for wrongs done during the Inquisition. Oh, that sounds wonderful. They're asking for forgiveness. Not quite. It was during a Mass on March 12th, in the year 2000, that Pope John Paul II asked for forgiveness for wrongs committed in the Inquisition by members of the Church. However, it wasn't individual members of the Church who caused and enforced through the civil authorities the terrors of the Inquisition. It was the Popes themselves. The popes themselves planned it. The popes themselves approved it. They gave their approval to it and organized it and appointed the people who carried it out. No apology was coming from the pope for that. 
No, he's just saying, well, there were some people in the church that, that you know, committed some wrongs, and we're sorry about that. So consequently, by means of a clever name change and by, by a false apology, Papal Rome has embarked once again on another attempt in a long line of them to rewrite history, revise the facts of history. Uh, Jean-Guy uh, Jean Vaillancourt, uh, an associate professor of sociology at the University of Montreal, wrote some salient observations. He stated, quote, after 1789, when the Roman Catholic Church was no longer able to use the repressive power of the state, Church authorities became more and more interested in using the legal and ideological power of the state through the laws enshrined in the concordats, through education of youth in schools and universities, and through welfare services such as hospitals and charity organizations. In fact, the Catholic Church increasingly became an ideological apparatus which fulfilled, still with a quotation, which fulfilled for the state and for the ruling class, listen to that, fulfilled for the state and the ruling class the functions necessary for their own growth and reproduction. He goes on to write, inside the church, the Catholic Church, the bishops and priests became functionaries of the central organization with little individual freedom of their own, unquote. Therefore, as uh, Viancourt pointed out, while the papacy no longer had the military might by which to enforce its will. Nonetheless, it controlled and continued its coercion, first by its concordats, the agreements with the civil authorities, and then by centralizing of its power in absolute laws and in its control of the laity, uh, the, the people in the pews, the worshipers, uh, its control of schools, its control of hospitals, universities, and welfare services, centralizing its power. See, it's necessary, uh, uh, Richard, I, I think it would be a good time to give an explanation in some detail of papal power through civil law, since many Bible believers have very little knowledge of this, whatever. Yes, I think that you're correct there that, Bill, to say that very few Bible believers have any idea of how Rome controls things in civil law by legal agreements between the Vatican and individual nations. This is done by what is called a concordat. To define a concordat, it is an international agreement that has binding power in civil law between individual nations and the Vatican. And the Vatican in these uh, these uh, agreements is known as the Holy See. That is the legal term it uses in these legal agreements. It has different things in these agreements recognized in civil law that are really spiritual and uh, things to do with education and property. For example, they claim legally in civil law the right to define doctrine, to educate Catholics according to the tenets and practice of the Catholic faith, and they include the Catholic social teaching and economics, and they include laws regarding church property, who can own what property. So this is in, in a civil agreement between a nation uh, and the Vatican. A concordat can also establish the appointing of bishops and the recognizing of Catholic law regarding marriage and annulment of marriage. And so we have uh, the fact that these concordats have been um, instigated and signed with many different nations. Prior to 1989, the Holy See had signed international agreements just principally with European and Latin American countries. And this had been established under Hitler uh, and Mussolini before that. But now there are concordance with many, many nations. For example, from 1950 to 1999, 128 
concordance were signed. Even nations of the Middle East, Asia, and Africa have entered into, into legal agreements with the Church of Rome. Moreover, the Roman Catholic Church has much influence besides concordats, where they have a legal agreement with the Church of Rome. They have legal agreements through embassies and where they are accepted as a civil power in different nations of the world. In actual fact, there are 174 nations that send ambassadors back and forth to the Vatican. 174 nations of the world have ambassadors or papal nuncios from Rome and they send their nuncios to Rome. This includes the United States. The United States had actually stopped sending ambassadors to Rome in 1865 because the Vatican had taken the side of the of the Confederates in the Civil War and the Vatican uh, was in bad standing with the the Congress and the Senate of the United States and they stopped having ambassadors. But this was all changed around under President Reagan. It was on January the 10th, 1984, that President Reagan re-established formal diplomatic relations with the Holy See. And it was really sad there was only one congressman who spoke against that in 1984 because people's, it, people's lack of knowledge of what the Vatican does through its ambassadors and through its concordats. So this is how the, the Vatican wields its civil authority as a civil power. It has concordats. I remember being in Slovakia in the year 2000 and I was visiting different churches and it was a real joy to find Bible-believing churches in Catholic Slovakia. But then it was that the year 2000 that the Vatican entered a concordat with Slovakia. And the Bible believers were really fearing the day would come, not that the bishop would object to their churches existing, but that the police would come to their doors because a concordat, a legal agreement, was made between Slovakia and the Church of Rome. And this has got from it has actually got worse since then, but that was, I was actually there in Slovakia in the year 2000 when this happened. In actual fact, Rome fulfills what was written in prophecy. In Revelation 17, it speaks about the woman riding, seated on the beast. The woman is the religious system seated on and ruling from the beast, the civil system. Roman Catholicism, in the course of its history, has used its civil power to bring in its persecution and its laws and its control of the nations. It's no longer persecution, but it is subtle civil control and now taking place through concordats and in 174 nations by having ambassadors work together with the Vatican in all these nations of the world. These are facts that people do not know and do not recognize, but they must be seen and must be understood. Now we come, Bill, to understand another tool of Rome, its philosophy and in economics. Could you explain that to us? Absolutely. A very important part of this is to understand that Rome uh, economic philosophy uh, is so uh, insidious and uh, controlling uh, and, as we will see, uh, anti-biblical. Pope Benedict, the present uh, pope at the time of this video, uh, Pope Benedict XVI and his Vatican system teach that private property is not personal. Like we think of private property in the West as, as being, you know, you 
You go out and you earn money and you buy something, whether it's private property as land or private property of, uh, of some material thing that you own, it's yours, your car, whatever it is. Well, the Pope has said uh, that that's not, that's not the case. Private property is not personal. It belongs to everyone. In his encyclical called God is Love, I'm not, this isn't some conspiracy theory, you can just go to the, they're very proud of the fact, they're very proud of the fact they believe these things. Go and look it up. Look up the encyclical, uh, Pope Benedict's encyclical called God is Love. He endorsed the principle called, quote, the universal ownership of all goods. Now the same principle implies uh, uh, possessions uh, and property belong to everyone. The, that principle is found in the writings of other popes as well, uh, going back to Leo the Thirteenth, Pi Pius the Eleventh, uh, Pope John the Twenty Third, Pope Paul the Sixth, uh, John Paul the uh, Second. The phrase "all goods" includes not only the goods found in nature, but manufactured goods as well. They belong to everybody, not just the person who earned the money to buy them. Um, well, you can recognize this for what it is. That's pure socialism. Uh, a Vatican Council, a Vatican Council II uh, document from Vatican Council II upholds this same principle of the so-called universal ownership of all goods and emphatically teaches in its official document, and that document, again look it up, it's called, that document is the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, paragraph 69, the exact wording, quote, if one is in extreme necessity, he has the right to procure for himself what he needs out of the riches of others." Unquote. Now hear that again. If one is in extreme necessity, he has the right to procure for himself what he needs out of the riches of others. In other words, take what you need from other people. And the church is upholding that. The more this socialistic principle is legally accepted, and the Catholic Church is trying to get this legal into, into law. The more it's accepted legally uh, in, by various nations, the greater crime that is committed against needy people themselves, particularly the one billion Catholics worldwide. Yet this doctrine of a prior right to all goods based on need is what Pope Benedict proposes as the fundamental norm of the state. He wants to impose this in civil law. And remember the history of the, of the papacy is that, that the popes think that they are above presidents of nations and kings and rulers of nations. And he wants to impose this on, on everyone. Uh, a share of the community's goods is to be guaranteed to every person, something no state and no institution has any business doing, much less can deliver in practice. It always becomes a dictatorship where the, the few control all the goods and, and services under socialism. Nevertheless, the Pope stated in section 26 of the encyclical that I just cited, quote, it is true that the pursuit of justice must be a fundamental norm of the state, now he's talking about all governments in the world, and that the aim of a just social order is to guarantee to each person according to the principle of subsidiarity, his share of the community's goods, unquote. See, the aim of the Pope's, quote, just social order is anti-biblical. It destroys individual responsibility and dependence on God for one's necessities and opportunities. Now, compare what you've heard so far with what the Bible says, what Scripture, God's Word says. If a man will not work, he should not eat. What, it, uh, what, the, what the Vatican is doing, is trying to do, is to replace the essentials of individual responsibility, of what the Bible says about economics, replace them with an entitlement mentality, with a socialistic mentality, dependent on the civil government, the civil state, for individual welfare. It's a power play. Whenever you hear these words about oh, socialism and you know, we've got to give to the needy and take from those who have more than they need to give to people who you know, don't have it, don't work, whatever it is, that's all power play. That's, that's, that's power. They want power. So such a policy is doomed to failure, as has been demonstrated in the world countless times. Um, biblically, the duty of civil government is not charity. 
That's not the function of civil government. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not biblical to take from people to give to others through the civil government. Uh, so biblically, the duty of civil government is enforcement of civil law and protection of a citizen through enemy attacks. Uh, when, when the Vatican principle is applied nation by nation, there are terrible, terribly dire consequences. Nevertheless, in the U.S. Catholic Bishop's uh, 1995 pastoral letter called Economic Justice for All, if you hear that phrase, you'll cringe, Economic Justice for All, the same principle, the very same principle is disseminated. And that states, quote, from this pastoral letter in 1995, in Catholic teaching, human rights include not only civil and political rights, but also economic rights. And it goes on to say, get this now, all people have a right to life, food, clothing, shelter, rest, medical care, education, and employment, unquote. And guess how that's going to be enforced? By civil governments taking tax money, taking property from people to enforce a so-called right to life, food, clothing, shelter, rest, medical care, education, and employment. There is no biblical support for the policy like that. Actually, such a redistribution of wealth falls into the category of theft. It takes by force from people who have earned the money and gives it to others who have not, and compare that with what Scripture says. For example, the impact of this policy in the United States alone results in the redistribution of 2.3 billion of your tax dollars through the auspices of Catholic charities each year. 2.3 billion each year through the auspices of Catholic charities. Such redistribution enhances the Catholic Church, Church's power tremendously uh, to promote its own socialist agenda for its own ends. The general policy of the Catholic Church for the Western world is very well documented. The frightfully wealthy Roman Catholic Church, and I, uh, if you don't know how wealthy they are, uh, it, it struck me when I was in South America, I had the uh, opportunity to go to six different countries in South America. And I toured a lot of cathedrals. They're all proud, they're very proud of their cathedrals. You see these gold statues and gold altars and gold chalices, solid gold, and, and uh, there's money. And you walk out the door of the church and people are living in cardboard boxes. Uh, so the frightfully wealthy Roman Catholic Church, who pur they purport to be the advocate and fighter for the poor and, and the disadvantaged. Uh, it's nonsense. And it's the, uh, on behalf of the poor, they want to gain material equality. Well, they don't do it in practice, do they? While outwardly material equality may sound good, such a materialistic social policy produces a false hope to which the impoverished Catholics become bound. It doesn't work. Thus the papacy, through a materialistic social policy and a false um, gospel and a false economy, the socialist economy, enslaves to itself these same Catholics who are struggling to acquire salvation uh, through the church and its sacraments. So the Lord God in the Bible doesn't teach uh, th this at all, that there's going to be equality of conditions among men. What did the Lord Jesus say? The poor shall always be with you. Uh, we are required, and we, we have, if, we're, if we're born again, we have the heart for the poor, and we want to help them, we want to contribute, we tithe to our church, we give to charity, we do what we can for, for people, and we give them the gospel. Uh, but uh, this is not the function of the civil government, certainly isn't by force. We don't go and uh, find some rich person and take their money so we can give it to poor people. That's what the Lord says, that's theft. So the Lord's key requirement of justice among men, uh, His requirements are revealed in the Ten Commandments and the civil and judicial laws that govern economic relations that are given throughout Scripture. Uh, there's been wonderful books written about the uh, economics of the Bible. What are, what are biblical economics? That's a study in and of, even of itself. From the biblical perspective, we have to understand just how enslaving these machinations of the Roman Catholic social teaching and practice are. Evangelicals ought to think carefully about the economic principles that are laid out in the Bible and compare those to what the Roman Catholic Church is promoting with considerable success. 
in the face of the spiritual death and the economic disaster that reigns through Vatican teaching and practice uh, as it all matters, all these matters related to those struggling in Roman Catholicism, we have to look constantly and in prayer to the God of all grace. There's a full article that cites these exact sources of the papal promotion of the socialist collective, uh, collective ownership uh, found on the Berean uh, Beacon website. Uh, look in the folder named Articles. It's called Papal Economics. It is necessary now to see what we have documented in this DVD, how it applies and how we can evaluate the message for our time. But first of all, it's necessary to see what the situation is in academic circles. In academic circles, there is a willful and profound ignorance of the papacy and the blight it has been on nations. This has been a policy and it continues to be the policy in academic circles that nobody challenges Rome. People who are secular writers and historians will not jeopardize their careers by exposing the Church of Rome. And so there is a, a consistent effort academically to ignore paper Rome. And it's, if it were not for DVDs like this and web pages where things like these are exposed, these things would not be known because it is a consistent effort not to challenge paper Rome. And Rome with its power, its political power and its economic power has been very, very successful to make sure that the, the writers of history books and those who, who produce uh, works in academic circles do not show the horrors of Rome. It's amazing too that the older works, we had older works that were critical of Rome in secular sources, in universities and libraries of the world, including the United States. We've had famous books removed from the library. One of these is Bernard Hassler's How the Pope Became Infallible. He was the one who withstood the papal decree in Vatican Council I and wrote against it. Even though he was a Roman Catholic Archbishop, he wrote against it because it did not fit in with what was the facts of history. His book has been removed and many other books critical of Romanism have been removed from public libraries, from university archives, from catalogues. And here the Jesuits and the movements such as the Opus Dei have been very successful in eliminating anything to oppose papal Rome from different universities and libraries. And this is not just in the United States, but across the world and they have succeeded. Then we have to see that this should not come as a surprise to us. In scripture we were told that the Antichrist would continue till the Lord comes back and that Rome would succeed in, in beguiling and in confusing a lot of people of the world. And the scripture states, for example, that the whole world lieth in wickedness. And it says, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. The scripture foretold that these things would be so. And so it should become no surprise to us that what scripture predicted is in actual fact the way things are. That the wicked do wickedly, and very few understand but it's for us who are true Bible believers to understand and to be able to, to look to the God of all grace, that he is the one who knows the beginning from the end and he will triumph at the end and we know that the Church of Rome will be brought down at the very end by the power of the Lord and we read that as we continue 
from Revelation 17 and 18 into chapter 19, we see the end of Babylon mystery religion. And we know that the Lord is proclaimed in all his glory as the one who has the riches of wisdom and understanding. He is the sovereign Lord and he reigns. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Even though it looks like the Church of Rome is triumphing, she will finally fall. And the one who is, triumph who is triumphing, the one who is succeeding is the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. It is Christ Jesus, the glorified Lord. And as more and more see the glory of God's grace, we see more and more people become Bible believers. It is our prayer that the very sentiment expressed at the end of, Re of Romans chapter 5 would become more and more a fact in our day. That where sin reigns unto death, that grace would reign through righteousness unto everlasting life by Jesus Christ. The Reformation saw that and we pray for a new Reformation in our own times that where the Church of Re Rome has reigned in its wickedness, that we would have true Bible believers stand up and that the reign of Christ Jesus would be seen more and more as people accept the true gospel and the true biblical church and the true assemblies of believers. And so we, we have documented in this DVD the Counter-Reformation and the manipulation of power that the Roman Church has done through its concordats, through its, its uh, political agreements with 174 nations. And we have seen how it has have succeeded in many ways bringing people under itself. But the Lord still reigns. And we pray that more and more people as the truth is seen in scripture and has been revealed in scripture and is proclaimed that more and more people would come to biblical faith and that we would learn and be wise of this whole reformation period to the modern days and what lessons we can learn from it and I'd like you to say a word about this Bill. Well amen brother that is so true I'm not sure that I can add anything to that uh, just in conclusion, we have documented uh, in this presentation uh, uh, the very nature uh, of the Antichrist, of the papacy, and its MO, its modus operandi. Uh, we've tried to explain to you, expose things, and many things I possibly you've never heard before. Uh, many things perhaps you meet with some skepticism, and uh, we've encouraged you to do your own independent research. Number one, read scripture. You should read the Bible every day, just as we need material food. For, if, we, if, you, if you would go a day or two days, whatever, without food, how do you think you'd feel? Eventually your body would shrivel up and you'd, you'd eventually die, of course. You'd get very weak. Uh, well, your body needs spiritual food as well, and that's the Word of God. Feed on the Word of God every day. Be in the Word of God. You need your feed your spirit. So what we've done in this DVD is, is, uh, is talk about the nature of the Antichrist and its modus operandi, know your enemy. Uh, the mystery of iniquity spoken of in Scripture. Many people think, oh, that's evil lives of atheists and fornicators and drunkards and prostitutes and things. No. It's the evil of false religion. That's the mystery of iniquity that Paul talks about. Scripture reveals Jesus Christ as the mystery of godliness. That's what it's, he's called. And the Antichrist is the mystery of iniquity. So the parallels between the two are very informative and very frightening. Just as the Lord God sends his angels to seal his servants in their foreheads, the Antichrist, by his agents, sets a mark in the foreheads of his devotees. Christ Jesus performed miracles. The Antichrist performs false signs and wonders. The Savior is seated upon a throne in majesty. There's also a seat for the Antichrist in opposition to him. Christ Jesus has his people, his church, 
There is, however, the Antichrist. He has his synagogue of Satan, his own false teachers, his people. In opposition to Christ, there is the Antichrist who is transformed into an angel of light, Scripture says, that uh, even if possible, the elect would be fooled. Yet Christ Jesus is truly the light of the world. Richard? Well, yes, and we truly thank the Lord that he chooses to limit the power of papal Rome and that the gospel of Christ is still the power of God unto salvation and that the gospel goes forth with might and power. It is Christ Jesus who is manifest, as Paul said in Romans. The righteousness of God is revealed, foretold by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is revealed. The very perfection of Christ Jesus is upon them that believe. And as you recognize that you're a sinner by nature and personal sin, and as you trust on Christ Jesus, God's own righteousness in Christ Jesus is legally credited to you. The wonder of what it is to be saved by grace. Not only are you forgiven your sins, but you are imputed. You are reckoned to be perfect in the perfection of Christ Jesus. This is the glory of the gospel. And that is what we proclaim. That is the wonder of who Christ Jesus is. We have documented the history, the sad history that has taken place under the deception of Romanism. But the Lord God omnipotent reigns and we know that the gospel of grace is the reigning factor and that grace will reign supremely and that finally Christ will come in all glory to bring home all his saints into the everlasting kingdom, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth. And so we know the end of history and we rejoice in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is sad to give the account of Roman Catholicism and all its intrigue and twisting and rewriting of scripture, but the fact is that God reigns and that the gospel is the magnificent of who Christ Jesus is in his power and authority. He is the one who has been revealed. He is the one who was foretold in the pages of the Old Testament and now is fulfilled. And we thank the Lord God for Christ Jesus. We thank the Father in heaven in the Holy Spirit who has convicted us and brought us to him and that we can give all praise, all glory and all worship to his name. I thank you Bill for what we have thank shared you. and may God be glorified and many souls saved with the praise and the glory of his grace. Amen. Amen.